Talking about Pi Game. Uh, how many folks Mug. have ever dreamed of March being a 2014. game designer, developer type person? And video games? No! Well, by the end of this meeting, you all will want to do that. Or I will have failed miserably. You'll be able to do it. And you'll be able to do it. You may not have the desire, but you'll be able to do it. So what we'll cover here is we'll cover a little bit about Pi Game, what it is. Uh, how to get started. We'll talk about events in Pi Game and how they work. Talk a little bit about getting some rectangles and images on the screen. Uh, some of the drawing primitives that are part of Pi Game. Talk about sprites. Uh, if you remember back in the 8-bit days, there were like hardware sprites and that. Now they're a little bit different than that. And we'll talk about uh, completed games um, because I ran out of time. But we will not. Uh, oh, hello. Okay. Uh, I've got some links here. Uh, first off, the Pi Game site is an excellent resource. There's plenty of source material out there on the Pi Game site. Uh, lots of example games. There's two books uh, that are really interesting. Uh, the first one is Making Games with Python and Pi Game, which is a Creative Commons licensed book available completely for free and also in paper form. Uh, it's the one that I would highly recommend. There's an, another one by the same author called Inventing, with, uh, Inventing Games with Python. And uh, it's a little more geared toward kids. Uh, I won't hold it against you, though, if you decide to pick it up and, and check it out, because it is still good. It's just a little more on the, you, you haven't done any programming yet, you're also 12 level. <laughs> um, there's the, uh, the program Arcade Games with Python and Pi Game, which is also excellent. It covers more sprites uh, than making games with Python and Pi Game. Uh, they don't even cover any of the sprites which you may see why in a little bit. And there's also a competition called Pi Week, uh, which is a week-long competition. It's held twice yearly. Uh, it is a week to take a game from concept to <coughs> production. And uh, I did it twice. I uh, haven't done it since. Um, I finished one and a half times. And uh, you'll see some of the results of that. So what is Pi Game? Pi Game is a framework uh, for Adding graphics and sound under the Python, it is over SDL, which is a simple direct media layer, uh, which you may be familiar with. It was developed by Loki Software uh, back in the late 90s. Uh, rest in peace, Loki. Uh, but basically, their work in porting games over to Linux uh, created a really great framework that is still used today. Uh, it is portable everywhere that Python and SDL are running. And it is also optimized. Uh, it uses C and some assembly underneath which makes it kind of a pain in the butt to use under virtual lamp, if you know what that is. Um, and it is simple. Even, uh, even I could procrastinate the entire week in a way and still come up with something functional. What it is not, it is not a direct uh, port of SDL. Uh, for anything that's a little more complicated, you may want to use PySDL for that. It is not OpenGL specific. You do not have to have an OpenGL card. It uses 2D. You can use OpenGL with it. Uh, what it does is it creates, uh, for lack of a better, a canvas and uses OpenGL to draw upon that. So it creates a surface that it draws on. Uh, it is not GUI dependent, so you can use it for, uh, if you like the event stuff, if you like the event handling, if you like the sound libraries and that, you can use it with that. And it is also not stagnant. Uh, the last release, uh, Train Event, was in 2009, and, uh, but there is still work on 2.0. Um, so they're doing some updates. I haven't followed the development that closely, so if you ask me it's about 2.0, I will deny all knowledge. But it is progressing. So what we're going to work on is an Al old Activision game called Kaboom. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with, Kaboom, it is uh, a game designed and developed by David Crane. Back in the 1980s, it ran on just about everything uh, back when. Used paddle controllers. Uh, what you did was you were the little bucket down here and you tried to catch the bombs that were falling overhead by the mad bomber. So let's get started <laughs> and do some development. In the Atari 800, wow. That was my computer. And that's, uh, for those of you who don't know who that is, that is Chris Crawford. He's one of my game designing idols. So uh, let's, let's take a look here and see what we got. I know you. <laughs> so, we can focus for a friend of mine. Well, you could have problems because the chips are stuck in. So, 
So can everyone see that? No, no of course no. not. Of course not. <coughs> Let me open up another terminal here. So let's start off. This is an extremely simple pie game program. What it does, we created a uh, rectangle up top, about 800 by 600. We have a main loop, which initializes the pie game, creates a uh, display, and then sits in this loop right here. It says for every event we get, we have one event that is a special called quit. What that event will do is whenever we exit out of there, it will clean up and do its stuff. And it looks a little something like this. So, hello world in Pygame. Not a whole lot of interesting stuff going on there. Let's move on, if we shall. So, I will check out. So, this is probably a little more interesting. I'm going to do this in the window instead. We're going to start off with a sprite, and what that will do is that we'll, we're creating a class called bomb, which is a sprite, and we're telling you where exactly to do a position on there. And if we go here, we get a little more into the sprite. So what this will do, and let me do a quick run on it in the interest of time, is it will create a circle. And what that circle will do, give it a position over here, I click position, tell it the size, we'll draw a circle inside of that, we'll add the, we'll add the sprite into containers. Containers are a list of all the sprites that are in there as part of a group. And you'll also see that I added some additional stuff as far as like a background fill, which doesn't work in this particular checkout, and that's because I had a bug in there. We told it to position it over at position 4040, which is over in the top left corner. Because on any screen, you start off from 0.0, .0 up in the top, and it goes down all the way to 800 by 600 down here. Sort of like a text screen, you say, okay, the top position will be up there, da da da, etc. All right. And what it is doing is this loop is continually going through, and it's finding all the events, it's going through. We added the sprite to an all container. Thank you. We do a clear of the screen first, we update, which then calls the sprites update routine. We find all of the dirty rectangles and we redisplay them. And you'll see, you'll note this little FPS clock tick. That's frames per second. <coughs> Every, it, in order to make sure that this thing doesn't run as fast as your computer, <coughs> tries to pause it a bit and let it breathe a little bit. It's sort of like a fine wine, it lets it breathe. And we tell it to do so every 30 seconds. 
check it out. This is going to get a little more interesting here. So now we have something that actually falls down. And that is in this code here, where you have the update. And the update will say, say take the y coordinate, add a speed to it, and then have that drop down and redraw it every single time. So every time the frame comes up, it reruns that update, adds the speed to it, and then sets the, the falling speed for it. I promise this will get much more interesting. All right. So now that we have that particular sprite, we set an alpha on it. Because before you had the little box around it, mm -hmm. that's not pretty at all. That's ugly. So we set an alpha channel for that particular thing. The alpha channel is up in here. Uh, up in here. So we set a source alpha on there, which is basically a flag to say make this particular surface a alpha surface, which allows it to then be transparent. Now you can see that we're eight minutes in roughly, and we have a falling bomb. Let's see what else we got here. We're not that far from the from the end. How far did I get? Who knows? So in here we added the bomber. And the bomber uses a drop bomb event. And what that is, you have different user events that you can set in this. So what I did is I set an alarm on there that says every X number of seconds, X number of milliseconds, uh, I sell it to drop a bomb. And I created a little formula here every 2,000 seconds, uh, minus the self madness times 60. Madness is basically the level that I have. Drop a bomb, okay? And so you get this little cadence of him dropping a bomb. He figures out how many of these actually dropped, and then uh, continues. So he has a set bomb timer, which sets an event timer that continually loops through. And then he drops the bomb whenever he hits that. And the event is handled down in here. We have the event type is of type bomb. Tell the bomber to drop the bomb. Okay? Any questions so far? I know I'm going a little fast. As I said, it was a quick introduction to this. Great. <laughs> so that was a little quick. So he uses the events to drop it in a nice rhythmic pace. Well, apparently that wasn't very rhythmic, now was it? Well, it was rhythmic. Just a little quick. You could have all caught that, right? Yeah. All right. So that was to get him to change the direction. So he has a little timer built in here that says anytime that he needs to change the direction, he will do so. And I set up a separate event it's a user event plus one. Every event that I set up that is user specific, I create a user event, and then I keep adding a one to it. You have a certain number of events that are available to you in Pygame, uh, from user event to num events. So you can check and see how many events you have. That you can do. Yes? When you say it's a user event, it is, it's more like an AI, right? But it's, just, it's called a user event? Okay. It's called a user event because it's user specified. So it's, it's something that you yourself can specify. So if you wanted to create a different... Like you being the developer. You being the developer, yes. That's what I mean by that. Okay. Check out this one. So this is a little more logic to the bomber itself. So we have a number of bombs that he's dropped. We have the update. We have it... Um, a timer for when he's going to set the uh, bombs off. We have the handler for when he's actually dropping a bomb, changing the direction. Let's see what he does here. 
So now he's going to be a little more slow about it, a little more groovy about this type of uh, dropping. And I think this one actually will do the levels. So when he actually finishes doing his dropping, and then it'll update the level. Let me check and see if that's still true. Madness. Okay, I don't think I got quite that far yet. Fix the sprite collision confusion. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this also introduces a floor. Now, when these bombs drop, now let me set this up so that you can see it while it's going at the same time. When those bombs are dropping, okay, I actually had another event too where you do the face, it'll start dropping. When these are dropping, these will keep dropping forever unless they actually hit something. And this is where we start introducing collisions. As you can see, right as they hit the bottom here, they disappear. That is because we set a collision, and the collisions are handled down in here. Now, I haven't shown the, uh, the containers part yet because it wasn't interesting. This part is actually interesting. We have a bomb, a bomber, and a floor. And each of those are all part of the all container, but they're also part of themselves. Don't ask me a whole lot about the sprite containers because I don't know a whole heck of a lot. But what I do know about them is that you can set up a list of collisions. So I set up a collision group between the bomb and the floor. When the bomb and the floor hit each other, there's this is returned. There's a bomb and floor. And they don't actually have it printing out that at this point. But if the bomb, if you have a list of collisions. So every time that you have a collision here, so when this hits, this bomb and this floor, this bomb and this floor, this bomb and this floor, etc. And it will return that. And what you can do from that is you can say, okay, the first off, the bomber will let him know that something has happened, that the bomb exploded. So then he can say the number of active bombs uh, is, is less. For every one that we hit, we have it explode. And unfortunately, I kind of punted on this one. Because the update, first off, it passes. And there's not really a whole lot going on as far as the explosion. It just kills off the sprite. Normally, there's a, a default mode where it's, which will actually destroy the sprite uh, down here. You see this false here? That actually, will, you can set that to say, okay, this will actually kill this particular sprite. If there's nothing that you really need to do with it, you don't need to call up anything, you just need it to just go away, that will do that for you. Any questions so far? All right. So this is a little more tweaking on this. I'm going to actually skip the tweaking. If it, this is all available on GitHub if you want to see some of the thought processes that went behind this. It's just basically me trying to figure out how to make the, uh, the bomber work a little bit better, how to make it slower. I'd say when I finally finished this, I got about 40% of the way done from a complete game. Okay. Now what makes this one interesting... I'm going to run this and then I'll show you the code. Now, if you've ever played the game Kaboom, uh, what happens in the actual game is when this explodes, each of those bombs explode in turn from the bottom up. Rather than actually figure out which bombs were in that particular list and then do it, I move the floor. <laughs> because the floor, once it finally, once, you know, the floor will finally clear off everything, there's already collision in place for it. 
So each of those bombs will then get removed, and then I'll have a clear spike. It's kind of like the pen machine, you know, just kind of clear. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I were to do this over again, I wouldn't have done that because it made my life hell trying to figure out how to what would determine an actual floor collision versus what was clearing the screen. So I did a little fancy stuff in order to get around that. That collision is handled here. Um, so I added um, another time, uh, event for the bomber to wait. So when he, you know, when everything is exploding, he waits a few seconds before he starts dropping bombs again to give the player some time to, to consider his actions. Uh, the floor movement. The floor movement is, most of the time, it sits completely still. If it's exploding a bomb, then it will move the floor up three. So with three pixels, it will move this, the floor upward. And that's handled here where it's doing a, uh, it's subtracting the speed from the y axis, from the y position. Okay? Now, it's not really <coughs> that, it's not preferable to actually show the floor moving because first off, you know, it just it doesn't make any sense. Why would the floor move? The floor is just sta static all the time. And what I did there is I set the floor to be an alpha channel. So it's invisible now when it actually hits. Get the space bar. So now we have most of the things to our game, except we don't have a player yet. And I'm only two commits away from the end of this. How does that work? Glad you asked, hypothetical user. <laughs> so here we have a player that can be moved around via the mouse. Hmm. How does that work? What I did, there's the player. That's it, in its entirety. And you may say, wait a minute, there's only one rectangle and I'm seeing three rectangles. And you may also say, wait a minute, there's not a whole lot here as far as like updates. All I'm doing is I'm figuring out how far he can go on the margins. But there's no, like, not, it's like the bomber. You know, he doesn't have any events that get called. Why is that? And the reason being, due to the magic of Python, and I probably could have done this in Pygame itself, but I chose not to because I went with what I know, is I instantiated the player up here. So the player sprite gets instantiated as an array. I then create three separate players. <coughs> Each of those has a collision capability that gets added up in here. And each of them gets the collision tested down here. So if the bomb hits the player, the bomb is then diffused, which basically kills the bomb. You could use it for scoring and that type of stuff. I didn't get that far. And then the bomber knows that the sprite has been diffused, so it says, okay, that's no longer an active bomb, carry on as usual. So what does that look like? I'm just going to leave it here for the time being. Okay? So then you have the boom. And then when it e gets reset, I delete, I actually pop the player off of here. So if he... Uh, now can you, if you catch the bomb with the second player or the third player, does it still diffuse the bomb? Yes. It's basically three rectangles up there that are all so acting the same. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. There. yeah. Now, I haven't actually played this through to get it so that you can actually see. See it on the high score yet. 
Well, there's there's different <laughs> levels in that. It actually gets different, harder, better, stronger, faster, whatever. Um, and that was in, added in there as well. And I didn't get too far into that. But let me show you the moment you've all been waiting for. That you didn't know that you were waiting for it, but you are waiting for yeah. it. <laughs> this is the completed game that I have. And what we have in here, let me go over here and show you the code real quick. That was a sprite. That was a full screen sprite. That was the size of the screen, it's called Explosion. Grand Explosion, sorry. Because we had little explosions eventually when I finished this, if I'd ever decide to. And then we had the Grand Explosion, which basically flickers on the screen. Okay? So any questions about this? Hmm. I can see doing like a Tetris or something. There are, there are examples of Tetris. There are, um, there's actually one commercial game called Galcon, uh, which was initially written in Pygame. I'm not entirely sure if it still is or not, but it was part of a Pi Week at one point. Uh, RenPy is also written in this. Now, so if you have 12 year olds programming this, right, by the time they get ready for professional work, they'll be able to do, you know, who knows, all kinds of fancy things, right? This is. This is pretty yeah. advanced stuff I mean, for the 12 weeks. Yeah. Events and interactions. <laughs> this is my Pi Week entry many, many years ago. It's available on GitHub as well. <laughs> So you're, well, you're you're the bugs. Yeah, you just get to spray the bugs. And what you, this is using basically everything that I showed you before. This is a sprite. These little guys are sprites. The sprays are each rect, uh, squares that fade out. They're alphas. It just it happens to have the sound and other components of a more complete game. Sure. Well, the flowers are bad. Yeah. Let me and just to give you get, to give you some insight too on uh, you don't necessarily have to use this for games. It doesn't have to be you know some kind of Twitch fest or something like that. You can also use it for other things. This is something that I wrote as a photo booth for someone's wedding. <laughs> well, you do. It, you have a giant canvas right here, the surface, which is taking camera input using Pygame camera. Yeah, this is all in a sprite overlaying it. That is a font that's being rendered up there using a sprite as well. I'm really sprite happy. Mm -hmm. I write a ton of sprites. So anyways. <laughs> There's several things going on here. That's a sprite up in there as well. And the flash is a full screen sprite that dims out. There's a, another trick on here. It takes two pictures on it. It takes a ninja shot. Now you know. And knowing you've half the battle. <coughs> Any questions? That's very cool. Yeah, that's super cool. Yes? Are card games easy? Uh, card games may be a little more difficult because you have to write the interface for doing drag and drop. Uh, if I were to do a card game, I would probably do something that actually had like mouse and other assorted, I mean, not necessarily mouse, but um, some kind of GUI, yeah, to it. It would handle buttons and that type of stuff and do a drag and drop, because otherwise you'd have to program all that stuff yourself. Hmm. May I have your attention, please? The time is now 8.30, and the library will be closing in 30 minutes at 9 o'clock. Please be advised that the Internet will shut down 10 minutes before closing. Thank you. If you, want, if, if you want to go and find any of this code, it is all available online on my GitHub address. Just look for Craig Maloney.
What's the next 30 minutes? We're going to hire internet to shut down. Yes. And uh, thank you. Check your info quick. That's pretty good. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, March 2014. I could see you could easily.